Hi, everyone, and welcome to online lectures 19 and 20. This is the t-test for independent samples. We're going to cover both days, day one and two. Okay, so let's start off by describing the t-test for independent samples and talk a little bit about how it's different from the other tests we've talked about so far. Well, we have one score for each person. So that kind of reminds us again of the Z test or T test for a single sample, because that also had one score for each person. But the next line is immediately what's different. Now we're gonna compare two groups or two samples of people, okay? So with the Z test and T test for a single sample, we were comparing a sample to a population. Now we're gonna compare two samples to each other. And each set of scores is gonna be from an entirely different group of people, an entirely different sample. We might do males versus females. We might do treatment versus control groups. We might do people who are younger versus people who are older. We have a variety of choices here. The only restriction is we can only have two groups, two samples, and they have to be entirely independent from each other. No one can overlap. So if someone in your treatment group then winds up joining your control group, that's a no-go. That would not work. Okay. All right. So what are the assumptions of this test? What are the assumptions of the t-test for independent samples? Well, we have our good old assumption that the population distributions are normal. That has been the same. The only difference now is we have to talk about two distributions being normal because we have two populations, one for each sample. Now the two populations have to have the same variance as each other, approximately, approximately the same, not gonna be exact. And the scores and values in both groups are independent of each other like we just described, right? No overlap between our groups. All right, so those are our main assumptions. So let's talk about an example. Let's just jump right in with an example. We wish to know if people in the community of Moore, Oklahoma will have significantly higher PCL scores than the people in the nearby community of Norman, Oklahoma. Now, I think we already discussed that the people in Moore and in Oklahoma had actually suffered a tornado. Um, and we are looking at their post-traumatic checklist scores as a result. And, but the people in the nearby community of Norman, Oklahoma were mostly spared from this tornado. So that's why we're comparing the two. So we're gonna sample eight people in Moore, Oklahoma and eight people in Norman, Oklahoma who complete the post-traumatic checklist one month after the tornado. What kind of test is this? One-tailed. Why? Why is it one-tailed? Because we claim the results uh, have a direction. We said they'll be higher in more than Norman. Okay. Had we said different, this would have been two-tailed. But because we said higher, it's one-tailed. Had we said lower, it would also be one-tailed. As long as we have some sort of direction, it's one-tailed. So once again, let's pull together our null and alternative hypotheses, which we'll pull directly from what's up here, starting with the word people. <laughs> people or persons in Moore, Oklahoma will have on average higher PCL scores than persons in Norman, Oklahoma. And then we just add the word not for the null. Persons in Moore, Oklahoma will not have on average higher PCL scores than persons in Norman, Oklahoma. And why is that on average there? Why do we say on average? Because we don't expect that every single person in Moore, Oklahoma will have a higher score than in Norman. We just expect those results to hold on average. We just expect really the means to be different. Okay. Had this been a two-tailed setup, had we said different, then we could have said there is a difference on average between PCL scores and more in Norman, Oklahoma. 
And there is not a difference on average between PCL scores in Moore and Norman, Oklahoma. We could have also pulled the phrase exactly from uh, the, how the problem was set up if we wanted to. People in the community of Moore, Oklahoma will not have different PCL scores than those in Norman, Oklahoma for the null. And people in the community of Moore, Oklahoma will have different PCL scores as compared to uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Okay, but this is just another way you can phrase it. All right. So now that you have four tests, and we started to do this before, but let's do it kind of more formally now. Let's compare each of these tests to the other. Let's see how we can differentiate each test. Let's see how we can identify just from the nature of a problem what test it is. Now, as we've been talking about so far, there's only one test where the population variance is known. There's only one test where the population variance is known. Remember which one? It's the z-test. For the z-test, we know the population variance. In other words, we know some form of sigma, some form of O with that little line on the edge of it, little tail, if you want to call it that. Um, we either know the variance or the standard deviation or the standard error of the mean for population. Okay. Now there are two tests for which we know the population mean. Think about which ones those are. It's the Z test and the T test for a single sample. So that gives us a clue immediately as how to distinguish these two tests from all others. If we see a population variance, hey, no need to look any further, you've got a z-test on your hands. If you see a population mean, then look if you see a population variance. If you do, it's a z-test. If you don't, it's a t-test for a single sample. Okay. Now, how about the number of values or scores per participant? Well, we've only talked about one test so far where there are two values or scores per participant, the others all have one apiece. So which one has two? It's the t-test for dependent samples. If you remember, we had a before score, an after score, or pre-test score, post-test score, or just two different scores for the same people under different conditions. And number of groups of participants, well, we've only talked about one test so far that has two samples of participants. And that would be the t-test for independent samples. So this is a, I, I like to think it's a helpful chart for really identifying between your different tests, being able to know which test I'm working with where. Okay, and since the formulas are a little different across each test, you kind of need to know which one. Okay. All right. So now let's move into degrees of freedom. Let's start off with the easy part and then we'll get into the actual formulas for this test. So now let's assume we're assigning players to positions on two baseball teams. We're assigning players to positions on two baseball teams. So the coach for player one assigns eight positions and the ninth player immediately knows where to go. And the coach on team two assigns eight positions and the ninth player immediately knows where to go. So now we've lost one degree of freedom for team one and one degree of freedom for team two. And similarly, for sample one, we lose one degree of freedom. For sample two, we lose one degree of freedom. So one way to think about the degrees of freedom is you take the sample size for sample one, minus one, the sample size for sample two, minus one, and then add up the results. Now, while that's theoretically pleasing, I like this formula a lot better. 
because it's just one step. This one's two steps, this one's one step, and it's just as easy to do. Take the sample size for group one, add the sample size for group two, and subtract two. Okay, so if sample size one was eight and sample size two was 10, we'd get to 18, right? Eight plus 10, 18, and then we'd subtract two and we've got 16. Okay. So now let's look at the formulas. Okay, so the first step, and this is the step you would take if you only have raw data, is to calculate the variance for each group or sample. So this on the left, let's just start with this one on the left. Okay, the S squared one. Looks just like our good old SUSAT. The only difference is we have some subscripts here because the subscript one represents the first group or sample and the subscript two represents the second group or sample. So now we have to calculate two variances. We have to do our SUSAD twice. Once for all the people in group one, once for all the people in group two. Okay. So again, how do we do that? We take each score minus the mean in group one. Okay, so this is just the mean for group one. Each score minus the mean for group one and square those. When we get all those squares, we add them all up. And we divide by sample size of one, sample size for group one minus one. And then we do the exact same thing for group two with the group two data. So one of the first things you might wanna do is actually just separate out your group one and group two data. So you keep them, keep them separate for this first step. Now here's the new step. Each, each one of these seems to have at least one kind of new funny thing that we're doing. And here's the new step here. It's to calculate the pooled variance. Because now that we have two variances, that's lovely. We have an S1 squared and S2 squared. But what are we to do with that? I don't know how to really take that into a standard error of the mean, which is usually our next step. So we have to first pool our variances. So how do we do that? Well, we take the sample size for group one minus one times the variance for group one. Then we take the sample size for group two minus one times the variance for group two. Then we can add those two together. Then we divide by our DF, remember what that is, right? Because it's N1 plus N2 minus two. Sample size one plus sample size two minus two. Okay. So we've got our variances. Then we put our two variances together into the pooled variance. Now we have actually a variance we can work with and we call it S squared pooled. Next, we're gonna calculate our standard error of the difference between means. So it's still a standard error. So it shouldn't surprise you too much when you look at a standard error formula that you see a variance on top, an N on the bottom, and a square root around the whole thing. So how do we do this? Well, we take R squared, pooled, excuse me, we take our pooled variance over sample size for one. We take our pooled variance, again, same number over sample size for two. We add those two together and we take the square root of the whole thing. So again, note that this number S squared pooled on the left side is the same as S squared pooled on the right side. Same number, if it's 14 on the left, it's 14 on the right, okay? All right, your N1 and N2 may be different depending on your sample sizes. Okay, so then we get our standard error, great. Now, finally, we get to calculate our T-score, right? So what is our 
test score or T score or T value. It's sample one minus sample two over the standard error. So sample one mean minus sample two mean over the standard error. And our DF we already talked about is N1 plus N2 minus two, sample size one plus sample size two minus two. So you might be wondering for the top part of this formula for the numerator here, how do we decide which one is sample one and how do we decide which one is sample two? Well, just to make my life easier, if I claimed that, um, that uh, Moore, Oklahoma would have higher scores than Norman, Oklahoma, I might go ahead and make Moore one and Norman two, just so that I get a positive number in the end, hopefully. But it doesn't matter, really, as long as you keep track of which way you're subtracting. OK. So now, with that knowledge, let's run through an example together. We wish to know if people in the community of Moore, Oklahoma, will have significantly different, different PCL scores from the people in the nearby community of Norman, Oklahoma. We sample 10 people in Moore, Oklahoma, and six people in Norman, Oklahoma, who complete the PCL, the post-traumatic checklist, one month after the tornado. Well, that's interesting. We have two sa different sample sizes here. One is 10, one is six. Do we care? No, it's fine. Where our formulas are perfectly capable of dealing with two different sample sizes. The sample mean of PCL scores in Moore, Oklahoma, X bar one is 36. And the sample mean of PCL scores in Norman, Oklahoma, X bar two is 30. The standard error of the difference between means is two. Okay, so let's collect the information we have and then decide where to go. Okay, so I've written down that we have our X bar one of 36, our X bar two of 30, our standard error of the difference between means of two. And we know that sample size one is 10 and sample size two is six. First of all, do we have raw data? No, no raw data here. So we're not gonna do step one. Okay, well then do we have an S squared one and an S squared two that we need to pool? Nope. Don't see that either. Yes, we're not going to do step two. Okay, fine. Let's go to step three. Uh, do we have to calculate the standard error? Well, do we have an S squared pooled up here that we need to put into this formula? Oh, no. And in fact, we already have a standard error. So I guess we don't have to calculate a standard error. So what are we up to? We're up to calculating the T-score. Wow, we get to go all the way down to step four. So let's go ahead and calculate the T-score here. Okay, so we can see now clearly what we have to put in, right? We're gonna put in the 36 for X bar one, the 30 for X bar two, the two for our standard error. And here we're gonna put our 10 for N1, our six for N2, then we can do our calculations. So here we go with 36 minus 30 over 2.0 or two, in this case, since we were given it just as two, our DF is 10 plus six minus two or 16 minus two. Okay, so our top resolves to six over two or three and our DF is 16 minus two or 14. Great, once again, we've gotten a T-score and we've gotten a DF. Now what? Now we get to look this up in the table. So let's assume our alpha was 0.05. Now we have to remember a few things. So let's go and look, is this one-tailed or two-tailed? And we can see we asked, we wanted to see if they're going to be significantly different from each other. So it's two tailed. It's two tailed. And our alpha is 0.05 in this case. 
We're assuming that it's 0.05. Okay. I think the problem neglected to say that, but we're going to go with 0.05 for this example. Okay. Um, I will always tell you the alpha in a problem you have to solve or for an exam or those sort of things. But in this case, we're assuming 0.05. Okay. So 0.05, two-tailed test. We're on the right side. We're down the middle column. Remember, our DF is 14. The number to beat is 2.145. Because this is two-tailed, we actually, um, it really only has to beat 2.145 or negative 2.145 because it's two-tailed. We don't have to worry about direction. We get 2.5% in each tail. So as long as you beat 2.145 or negative 2.145, you're okay. So does three beat 2.145? Sure. Let's say we had subtracted 30 minus 36 then we would have gotten negative six over 2.0 or negative three. And then we would have asked the question, does negative three beat negative 2.145? The answer would still be yes. Because if you recall, negative three is further away from zero than is negative 2.145. We wanna be more extreme, further in the tails, further away from zero, okay. All right, so now a quick word about significance. Let me introduce you to my latest significant others. And we see all these P less than 0.05s. And it says it was getting harder and harder to find a truly meaningful relationship at the medical journal happy hour. So the only thing is um, that I wanna point out and we'll, you know, this is something you'll probably hear again in 246 and potentially in other classes that it seems that people only report in journals when they actually get significant results because it's very hard to publish a non-significant result in the journal. Journals tend to be only interested in what's new and interesting and significant, not what's non-significant. But it's just as important really to look at our non-significant results. Okay, so even when we don't reject the null, those results are still just as important. Um, also a quick word about significance that goes beyond that little highlight. And that is, when is a study significant? Well, if you rejected the null, the study's significant. It's as simple as that. If you rejected the null, the study is significant. But even if you didn't reject the null, and this only comes up with one tail tests. If you have a one tail test, you didn't reject the null, it still might be significant. How is that possible? Well, if you remember, significant only has to do with how far away you are in the tail. For a one tail test, we actually have to ask an additional question. Is it in the correct order? is the relationship the one that we predicted, right? If we predicted higher, did it come out higher? So let's say we predicted something would be higher and it came out lower, way lower. It might be significant because it might be way out in that left tail, but we're not gonna reject the null. We don't care about that because we were only looking for the right tail. So it still might be significant Oh, that was supposed to be air quotes. It still might be significant, but it's not, but we won't reject the null. Okay. Now this next little section here, and it'll be relatively short, I promise, um, before we get into the quiz. Um, this next little section here is about the different methods for calculating our T scores and Z scores. So in other words, I just wanna show you how these different scores all compare. So for example, notice how similar the equations are for a variance in a single sample, a variance 
in a dependent samples and a variance in an independent samples. On the top, we're always subtracting scores minus the mean. On the bottom, we're always using n minus one. And in the end, it's always SS over DF. Now, why isn't there a variance here for the Z score or Z test? You know, because you were already given it. So we don't have to calculate that one, right? Right, okay. So these are how the variances are all similar. Next, let's look at how the standard error of the means are all similar. Look how we always have a variance in the top and an N in the bottom. And we take the square root of the whole thing. Or we have a standard deviation in the top and N in the bottom. And we just take the square root of the bottom. But they're all the same. Really, they're all telling you the same information. They might be calculated slightly differently. I'll give you that. But they're all very similar. Let's just say similar, okay. And then finally for our Z and T scores, we have subtracting means in the top, standard error of the mean in the bottom. Subtracting means in the top, standard error of the means in the bottom. And with our degree of freedom, we're always taking an N and subtracting something from it. Okay, so if that didn't quite grab your attention or you didn't enjoy those last few slides, those, just those last three that I showed you with the variances, the SEM and the Z and T scores, that's okay. It was just here to try to help you um, maybe uh, understand the connection between these tests a little more, but you don't have to worry about those three slides, okay? You don't have to worry about those three slides. So now I invite you to go into quiz six. The password is 6226 and answer both questions. Okay, so quiz six, password is 6226 and answer both questions. That's all I have for you guys. Um, stay safe, be well, and have a great day.